Jerry, welcome to the show. Thanks, Aiden. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is uh, this is going to be really fun. I, I I just mentioned to you that I uh, am a big fan. I uh, listened to your the audiobook version of your book uh, twice, uh, so I have many many questions for you today. Uh, but you have uh, had quite the extensive um, leadership career, and you've coached a lot of leaders. You run a popular boot camp called Reboot. Uh, you've been a venture capitalist. Uh, you've been in the, the startup game. Uh, you've been a writer. You've done many, many things. So I uh, have range. You have range. <laughs> that is a very good, good way to describe it. Uh, so yes. Um, and I think, uh, so, so all, all this to say is there's a lot that we're going to talk about, uh, but maybe one place where, where we can start is, um, when you first started leading teams as far back as you can remember when that happened, uh, yeah. what would you say, like, if you were to just analyze the way that you worked back then, what were some of the early management mistakes that you think you made? Uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say if I look backwards, my first, uh, well, my first exposures were probably when I was a teenager uh, acting as a foreman on a locker repair crew that would descend each summer in, into local school districts and fix the school lockers. But I'm going to not talk about that period. I think the mo more interesting period was probably in my early 20s when I was first a reporter, then editor, and then uh, eventually one of the managers at a magazine. And uh, the magazine was called Information Week. It was a print magazine focused on the technology sector. The brand is still alive as a, uh, as a web-only enterprise. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of the mistakes I made were very, very, are very familiar to me now as a coach because I see people doing the same things. Um, so for example, one of the things that, that uh, popped out at me immediately as a memory was um, I was very young. I was uh, 24, I think, when I was promoted first up the ranks as a reporter and then eventually the number two editor at the magazine. And most of the people who reported to me were more senior uh, in age, more experienced, um, knew more about the work than I did. And I think that um, uh, the result of that was that I was deeply insecure about uh, the judgment calls that I had to make. And um, I forgot or lost touch with the fact that the, po the folks who promoted me, two people, Becky Barner and Leighton McCartney, promoted me because they, they saw in me that I had uh, a view of the where the magazine should go. And so I probably leaned a little too heavily at that time on having all the right answers as a way to lead and the brittleness that comes from believing that uh, to be successful as a leader, you had to be the smartest person in the room. And uh, that led to a whole bunch of mistakes that I made that, uh, um, you know, if I could go back in time, I might have done differently. So that makes a, a lot of sense. So one of the one of the things that you just said was, um, you know, you didn't have all the answers. And I think this is a topic that you talk a lot about, which is leaders don't need to have all of the answers. Um, what what should people do when they when they, I guess, come across a situation where they really don't know what to do? They should be honest and say, I don't know what to do. I mean, you know, this sounds radical when I say it, but it's actually pretty simple. It's hard. It's hard as hell because it, it, it taps into all the insecurities that we have. And again, to use myself as an example, 
Um, I was so insecure about coming across as someone who didn't have the answers and therefore was not justified to have been promoted over these people who had many more years than I did experience, right? Um, but there's something really powerful when about when someone who has been tasked with leading an initiative says to the team, I'm not sure what to do. What do you think? See, I'm not abdicating the responsibility. When I do that, I'm not abdicating the responsibility to make the decision. But I'm pulling down the, 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 the bullshit mask that says I have all the answers. No one has all the answers. It's, it's an absurd expectation that we carry into those first leadership experiences. Um, and we do that because we are convinced that the team will no longer support us as a leader if we don't have the answers. The last thing I'll say about this in this moment is to is a breakthrough for me was early on in my 20s. I, I started to gobble up leadership books. I read everything I could get my hands on. And you know, working for a magazine was really great because people would send us books uh, to review. So I just took it upon myself to read and review everything. And I remember back then reading, and I believe it was Peter Drucker who said essentially that a leader's job is to ask the right questions. Now, let's acknowledge how simplistic that is and yet how profound it is. It's antithetical to every projected ideal that we have of what a leader is supposed to be, right? A leader's job is to ask the right questions. What? Right? And I will go further, ask questions, the answers to which you don't possibly know. What? But think about how liberating it is. Think about how frustrating it is to be led by someone who doesn't know as much as you do or pretends that they do. And then think about that experience of someone who has more power than you turning to you and saying, what would you do? Think about what that does for the team. It's marvelous. You know, when you, when you put it in, in those lights, especially, um, where putting yourselves in, in the other person's shoes, someone who has more power asking you, uh, but then also playing, you know, if the, you're in their shoes, someone who really doesn't know, <laughs> Uh, pretending that they do it, you know, it, uh, it, it will come across and, and people do know. Um, so I guess one question about this, which is maybe like a, a little bit broader is the, um, I'm going to ask you a question and then, and then I'm going to revert back to something that you talk about in the book, but should we make people, um, should we, should we promote people to be in charge of people who are, uh, others who are more experienced than them. What do you mean? So the, you know, one, one of the, one of the questions, you know, often is that like, you know, when, when you're in a situation where uh, you are in charge of, or, you know, from a management stance in charge of a team and some of the, that team is maybe a lot older, a lot more experienced um, you know, is that like a, uh, so should we avoid putting people into those uh, positions or, or, or tread carefully when doing something like that? Or uh, is that something that is, we should just catapult people into uh, doing if we feel like they are uh, able to uh, make decisions or make the type of decisions that, that we want them to. So I'm going back to when you got promoted uh, mm -hmm. to run the magazine. Do you think mm -hmm. like looking back on it, that was the right move to have promoted you into that position being younger and say le less experienced than others in that field? So Aiden, you've listened to me on various podcasts. So you know what I'm about to do. You may not have expected it, but this is the moment. Okay. So I find your, your question really fascinating. And I promise you, I will get to an answer but I wanna know why you're asking the question. 
Uh, what? So let me just finish the question. What story are you telling yourself about the scenario that leads to that question? Yeah, I'm thinking about uh, I'm thinking about uh, an example uh, where mm -hmm. uh, there is a decision to be made where we could have a situation where just like you were promoted to run uh, that magazine, uh, mm -hmm. that there would be a situation uh, where I would have the ability to do something very similar. Uh, so I'm I'm just trying to think about like the. Uh, the circumstances under which like that decision was made to, to get you to run the magazine. So you're empathizing with the folks who promoted with me and you're nodding. And so, and that, and the thing about empathy to remember is that there's some construction going on in the background. I apologize for that. Um, the thing to remember about empathy is that it's rooted in our own experience. And so what I see you doing right now is, is either imagining yourself in that situation or actually recalling being in that situation. Am I close? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, okay. So, and the question you're asking in effect was, is it the right thing to do? Yes. To do this, okay. So I want you to step into a place, a different place. Let's imagine it was the wrong thing to do. Notice how that feels. Step into your own leadership. You're the El Jefe, you're the boss. You're the one with the power. And you've made a decision to promote someone who has less experience over those who have more experience. And it turned out to be the wrong decision. How does that feel? Not that bad. Most decisions are not irreversible. Okay. So what just happened was the fearful part of your brain got quieted by the prefrontal cortex that explained to itself, don't worry about it. It's going to be fine. But I want you to touch back into that fear because that fear is really, really interesting. The fear of a leader making the wrong decision is related to the belief that the leader has to have all the right answers. Can you see that? Yeah. It's, it, it's two sides of a similar position of the same coin, which basically says you better be right. Because if you're wrong, you're a fuck up. Right? And what's really, really interesting is the minute I brought your attention to it, your prefrontal cortex kicked in and said, it's okay, don't worry about it. No decision is irrevocable. You can fix it after the fact. Okay. So notice something. I never answered your question. No, you didn't. <laughs> But what's the answer to your question? Um, the answer to my question is uh, there is no right answer, I think. Look at that. In fact, bringing your attention to the, to the wish for the right answer starts to open up really interesting avenues of inquiry like, what am I so afraid of? What's the consequence? Oh, I made the wrong decision. Because now I'll go back to the answer. Sometimes it's the right thing to do. As it turned out in my situation, two years after making that promotion, our magazine went from being number five in a five magazine market to number one. Was it me? No, it was a whole bunch of decisions that they made and a whole bunch of decisions that I made. The people that resented me being promoted ended up liking me. And some of them remain friends with me to this day. So on the whole, not a bad decision. That's awesome. I w wanted to ask that question because then I was going to flip it and uh, mm -hmm. go back to something that you talked about in the book, which I relate to. 
um, which is, I think you have this experience with a lot of clients. I, I feel like I would be one of those types of clients uh, that would uh, maybe did really well in school, uh, mm -hmm. got A's and A pluses. And so we grew up thinking that, you know, there, there is a right answer. There's a playbook for everything. and yeah, <laughs> for everything, mm -hmm. but, but it turns out that, uh, that's, that's not the case. And it, it's a very interesting, you know, in thinking about it. And I've thought about this before as well, which is like, you know, when you get into university and you, and you're going to school, mm -hmm. like there's a very specific set of things that you need to do. And if you mm -hmm. do those things by the metric of, you know, grades, like there's a very specific outcome. It, it, it's all like, there, there's not much uh, that you need to necessarily innovate on. Uh, but the second that you're out of there, like there, there all of a sudden is, is no playbook. So how do, how do you get people to kind of understand this? Because I mean, it sounds simple, uh, <laughs> but, but I but think, people, but yeah, I mean, even in this case, which is like, when I ask you, you know, how do you make the decision to promote someone into such a role? I mean, effectively, I'm asking you for the, for the answer. Yeah, you, 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 you were. And, and I think that you're, you're wise uh, in making the association with the way we've been socialized from childhood, right? And schools, and most schools are a good example of what we're talking about, um, where there's a systemic approach to things that, that, lead to the output, right? And what's the output that we want? A pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and happiness and sunshine and milk and honey for the rest of our lives. What's the God awful reality? It's a lot more difficult than that. Right? You could have a pot of gold and be miserable. You could have, you know, happiness and no pot of gold. Well, that's confusing. But I did, I, I, I did all the right things Right? I joined the right clubs. I, you know, I took the right classes. I got the right grades. I did, you know, I wore clean underwear every day in case I got into an accident, the way my mother warned me, right? I did all the right things and I still struggle. And, and one of the really profound challenges is that human nature is when confronted with that reality, turns the blame inward oh, everybody else must have figured it out. So then that little whispery voice that lives inside of us that says, you don't have a fucking clue, turns out to have been right all along. So I'm going to give you some relief. It's a lie. How do we know it's a lie? Because the world is much more mysterious than that. Good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people all the time. As one of my Buddhist teachers once said at a wedding, no less, pain is not punishment, pleasure is not reward. See, we're, 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 we're organized to think that if I do the right things, I will be what? Happy forever. What's lost is the opportunity to develop true grit the opportunity to develop resilience, which in my mind is the most important character trait of any leader, but more important, the most important character trait of any adult. Because as I wrote in the book, true grit, resilience leads to equanimity. The world is a piece of shit and I'm okay. The world is great and I'm okay. That's what we really want. It's the ability to feel okay, regardless. Yeah, you know this. Uh, this makes a lot of sense, and it um, another thing that that you you mentioned triggered this uh, um, part that you talk about in the book. So you said that we a lot of us think what we want is this thing that is just going to make us happy forever. Uh, and then there is this part where you, you also talk about, I think it might have been another Buddhist teaching where things are always um, falling apart. And, mm. and it was really funny. I think you mentioned that the, you, you finally understood it 
And then the teacher said, well, your understanding of this <laughs> is also falling apart, <laughs> which is really funny. Um, yeah. But equanimity. So that's what people really want, which is that no matter what happens, um, you know, they're, they're, they're going to be okay. Um, the thing that I wanted to chat about, which is, which is, was really interesting. And I, I thought it was a very novel approach because uh, just going back to this, you know, people want a playbook uh, of how to be a better leader, how to be a better CEO, how to run, run a team better. And I think like one of the, the core lessons that, that I've taken away from, uh, from, from anything that I've learned from you is that it, it's about learning how to almost grow up first. Um, yeah. Could you maybe describe what it means to grow up as a leader and like why that's the, the, the first thing that needs to happen before you can become a great leader? Well, actually, what I would say, the way I would frame it is that uh, the task that exists before all of us is to use the challenge of leadership to grow up. So it's not sequenced the way you described it. You don't have to grow up to be a leader. But those who don't use the challenges of leadership to complete the process of becoming a better person, a better human, miss out an opportunity. And I'm actually gonna link it back to the first observation that you made. Uh, and that teacher that you're referencing is Pema Chodron, the Buddhist nun. And she was teaching on the, on the Buddhist concept called impermanence, which is this notion that things are falling apart all the time, right? And impermanence is a really important and useful tool to understand or concept to understand because behind the belief that there's a playbook is a belief that there's a right way to do everything. And it's just a matter to figure it out. This is a puzzle. Problem is, uh, as is often the case in businesses, you craft a business plan. You think of every contingency. And then some crazy shit happens, right? And you didn't plan for that. And so resilience in the business is the capacity to withstand the unplanned for event, right? And so if we go into the planning process with the acceptance of impermanence, we plan our best, but the real effort is in building the capacity to withstand the changes that occur regardless, right? That's the real leadership capability. When we are capable of doing that and applying that not only to our job as leaders, we then get to complete the process of growing up. So for example, what you asked, what is a, what is a grown up? A grown up in a sense, and by the way, I don't think we ever finish the process of growing up. I think we're always in the practice of growing up. Grown up uh, uses every experience that, there hap that happens to them to, to go deeper in their own development. So I was just talking to a client before our call and we were talking about the three or four people who are most upsetting to that person. They're an investor. So it's a couple of CEOs at portfolio companies and it's a partner and that kind of thing. And I asked a simple question. Why does that behavior upset you so much? Right? Rather than going down the rabbit hole of telling me again and again and again about how awful the behavior is, we use the question to say, why is that so upsetting? And we ended up him being five years old, trying to take care of his mother who was miserable no matter how much he did. That's that growing up moment. That's that using the challenge to no longer repeat the pattern of being a jerk because my client can be a jerk to people we use that challenge to unpack who am I as a person so that I can then be in charge of my own life and not 
as the great psychologist Carl Jung would say, allow the unconscious to direct my life and to call it fate. Right? That's what I mean by that growing up process. Who am I? How am I wired? Why do I do the things that I do? So that I can then choose the way I'm going to respond to the world. That that makes a lot of sense. And um, there there are other things that you also talk about, which are which are kind of related. Um, you know, the first first point is you use the use the uh, terminology radical self inquiry, and um, you know, self inquiry to me makes sense. What what is um, what is the word radical in, in in this particular case? Does does it just kind of mean, uh, you know, just trying to go deeper and deeper, or like how how do you view self inquiry versus radical self inquiry, and and how they're different? Well, I call it radical more often than not because we typically don't do the work. A good example to go back to what I was just talking about. Somebody pisses you off. You call a friend. What do you want to talk about? How awful the other person is. You never really want to say, who does that remind me of? Why is that challenging to me? What other feelings does it come up with? We don't want to ask those questions. We like to live comfortably behind the mask that says, as Jean-Paul Sartre once said, all the other people are, um, hell is other people, right? Well, hold on here. You're somebody else's other person. You're somebody else's awful person. So maybe what we should do is use the experience of being triggered to radically inquire within and say, remember the question from the book, how have I been complicit in creating the conditions I say I don't want? Right? Classic example, you have a colleague, you're the CEO, you have a colleague who really pisses you off all the time. My question is not, how do you change that person's behavior? My question is, who hired them? Right? And you're smiling because that's the important question. And why have you not fired them? Oh, there's a benefit to having that person there. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> Right? That's what I mean when I say it's radical. It's because we don't do this. We don't train ourselves to strip away mass. We just get habituated in our patterns and we just say, ah, everybody's awful all the time. Blah, blah, blah. Stop. Life is much more interesting when you ask those questions. You will definitely learn a lot if you, if you did that more often. You know the the other term that that you use um, in the book, what I, which I really enjoyed, was um, a ghost in the machine. Um, and of course, like this, uh, this comes from the software world where you have subroutines that are you know very very old. You know they somehow still exist in the software and they cause strange behavior. Um, and I, I guess like a lot of these patterns that you've developed, like ways, heuristics that you maybe subconsciously use to make decisions uh, are, you know, like, like the story that you said when you were five years old and, and something happened and that has influenced, um, but, it, but it's very interesting. So it's, uh, it's, it's a identifying what those are and then asking yourself if, if those are actually still useful or not. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take it back even one level. It's radical to even acknowledge that there are subroutines running your life, right? Because we just presume that those are facts. Here, here's a good example. Um, money, if I had enough money, I would be happy. Right, that's, a, that's an assumption. Or here's another one that's a contradiction uh, the pursuit of money is evil. Now, if I just poke on either one of those and ask someone about their family's relationship with money, all of a sudden we start seeing 
the roots of all the decisions that they make. Which career did you choose? Why did you choose this job versus that job? Right? And if what we're trying to do is unpack an awareness of who we are and why we behave, how can you do that without understanding the basic input, input output system, your BIOS, that defines who you are, right? Another one would be anger is a bad thing. Anger is a good thing. Anger has no quality. It just is anger. But when you start to examine these things, you start to understand the reasons behind the choices that you've made. Why did you hire that person? Why do you maintain that relationship? Why do you repeatedly date the same person again and again and again, even though their names change? Why do you find yourself working for the same company, even though you work for different companies? That's all part of that, what I referred to as radical self-inquiry process really starting to unpack those things. Yeah. And some of these subroutines can actually be useful too, right? Not all the ghosts need to be gotten rid of, but it's important to yeah. understand what they are. Yeah. And I'm glad you made that point. Um, it's really easy to believe that the belief systems, which is what we're referring to, and I call them the ghost in the machine, are somehow bad and need to be exercised. No, in fact, the reason that a lot of these beliefs, belief systems persist is that they were successful. They worked. They got you out of the situation that you were in that first form. You might've been five and feeling powerless. And so the way you made sense of the world is to believe that X happens and Y happens, okay. And then if I repeat that behavior again and again and again, then that makes sense. The issue, as you point out, is when we get to chronologically adult ages, what happens is many of the belief systems, we start to out outgrow them, but we don't question them. We just live with the conflict that gets created. So it might be a conflict with a romantic partner who's, who, you know, who ticks you off because they spent $500 on some gift. And don't you understand money doesn't grow on trees, right? And all of a sudden we find ourselves, you know, quoting our father, <laughs> right? And so not only are you not five years old anymore, but your partner isn't your mother who was yelled at by your father. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So. Some of these, you know, when it comes to um, some, of, some of these belief systems, how hard is it to replace them? Like one, one is to exercise them like you, you mentioned. But if, um, if, you know, your environment kind of programs some of these into you, like can you, can you also change them or instill new ones? You know, new ones like um, I am a great leader, for example, or things that instill confidence or will make yeah, you more yeah. successful? It's a, you're asking a good question. And so it's a two-step process. This kind of transformation that we're talking about is a two-step process. The first thing you have to do is recognize that the subroutines are operating. It's critically important. The second thing you want to do is ask, how do those subroutines continue to serve you? Or do they continue to serve you? because very often they're very useful. The third thing would be to say, well, what's actually true now, right? So I might have had a subroutine that says, anger is dangerous. Therefore, anytime I'm angry, become anxious, right? And then as an adult, I'm walking around anxious all the time. Oh, wait, if I talk about what's pissed me off, maybe I won't feel anxious, okay? But now what's true is that I am no longer as powerless as I once was, right? So I, I would shy away from the notion of replacing one set of programming with a new set of programming. What I'd rather do is have a kind of more adaptive learning system that doesn't require so much programming. 
that just says, ha, huh, my ability to be discerning about certain situations matches my chronological age, AKA wisdom. Ah, huh. so when faced with, should I promote this person or not? Well, what's the rule? No, no rule, look at the situation. What's going to happen if I promote this person? And what's going to happen if I make a mistake? That's discernment. Yeah, you know, it makes sense. One of the one of the things that comes to mind is when you are going to make a decision, and it's true that there are no right answers, um, but sometimes it, it is helpful to uh, it, it is helpful to to look outside and 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 look at examples to to almost like learn one what is possible and are there things uh, that can be learned. But I think like it's it's what you said, which is that every situation is unique and you you still have to be adaptive, um, and you can be informed by other situations, but you really have to like not use it as a playbook because like every situation. Well, that's right. You know the human brain evolved to use fast pattern matching to survive, right? So I come to an intersection, I'm walking across the street, I see the sign flashes green and walk. The fast pattern match tells me it's safe to cross the street. That's a very useful tool. And a car turns the corner and speeds around the corner and knocks me down, right? The sermon would say, even though the light turned green, look both ways before you cross. Use your adult brain to figure things out, right? And so we use the fast pattern matching for exactly what it's designed to do, which is to make life a little bit easier, but don't rely exclusively on that to run your life, to operate your life. That's when you can get hit by a car. Yeah, it's uh, so much of us run so much of our lives in uh, in autopilot, and sometimes it's it's really nice to start to be aware of the things that you're doing and actually experience life to it to, to its fullest. Um, well said. You know the the thing that I wanted to also chat about, and uh, you know maybe part of this is you know learning to grow up to be able to lead better, or at least, um, at least understanding um, why some of us avoid certain things like conflict. Uh, but some of your, you know, you, you had an article on Medium, which, which talked about this a little bit more. And you said conflict avoided is conflict postponed. And so, you know, the question is, like, are, are you, uh, are you saying that when you sense that there might be a conflict, you should just go ahead and have it? Or how do you think about that? I think you should get really, really curious. Uh, moments of conflict can be really scary. And if we're socialized as children, that conflict and anger might lead to yelling and other forms of violence, we are going to avoid them like the plague, okay? And yet conflict within organizations is really interesting. Um, sometimes conflict occurs because two people are acting from their, their, their lesser selves. They're acting from their own subroutines. But sometimes there are genuine disagreements about ways forward. And uh, when we avoid the conflict, not only do we kick the can down the road, and ultimately have to deal with the conflict anyway. But we, uh, of, we miss the opportunity to really go deep and be curious. See, if we're brave in those instances, we get to examine what the various positions are that are in conflict and then lift up and out of the conflict innovation. There's, there's a tight correlation between positive conflict within an organization and high innovation. Because high innovation, innovation requires changing things as they are 
And there's almost always somebody invested in keeping things exactly as they are. So there's conflict, right? But if we approach all conflict as a source of fear, then what ends up happening is we actually stifle innovation. And the, the most innovative thinkers in our team, will they'll leave because they like the new. So uh, conflicts are really, really interesting area to sort of examine what's actually happening within a team. What are the suppositions? What are the subroutines that sort of are the unspoken values of a team, right? The, the, the value may be within the team, the spoken value may be we're committed to transparency. The unspoken value is we walk on eggshells around people's feelings because we don't want to hurt people's feelings, right? And there's a conflict in there. Unnamed, it, become, it, it goes unresolved. You know, I, I think this uh, concept makes a lot of sense in, in other ways as well. You know, we, we talked about, you, you, you were saying, you, one of the questions that you brought up just er, earlier is, you know, if you, um, if, if you don't like this person or this person's not working out in the organization, A, who hired them? <laughs> which, is a, <laughs> which is a good question. Uh, but B, you know, uh, wh why not? fire them. And so, and, and that's a fi firing is in general, not very easy ever. Uh, mm -hmm. But a lot of it is, is, is what you said. And it just goes back to this concept of, uh, of conflict, because it's the fear of, um, I mean, it could be many fears. It's a fear of, uh, you know, hurting the other person. It could be mm -hmm. fear of, uh, you know, what if you made the wrong decision? What are the repercussions? It's, it's all these uh, different fears. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, it, can, can, let me expand upon that too, because I, you know, I was sort of tongue in cheek when I said, you know, who hired them. Um, if you have a colleague who isn't working well in the position, um, it's such an interesting opportunity to just sort of explore. Well, how did they get hired in the first place? What was their expectation of the job? How well written was the job description? How well discussed was that were the expectations. What kind of feedback was the person getting all along? How have they been responded to, right? So grown up leaders, if you will, use those instances to unpack the processes, to unpack the value system, spoken and unspoken, to really extract a better way to do things, right? There, there, is a, there is an assumption behind the colleague who isn't working out, which is uh, in psychological terms, we'd call it splitting, where someone is either all bad or all good. And the truth is almost no one is all bad or all good. Okay. More often than not, a colleague has to uh, move on because they were the wrong person for their job. Well, there are multiple people who are responsible for that error including the people who made the hire in the first place. So what was broken about the process that allowed the wrong person to be put into that position or be promoted into that position? And is there anything that we need to change about the process to make the system, to make the organization more resilient and healthy and less toxic? But you, you see what I'm doing here? It's like, I'm really trying to extract out what are the lessons? This is kind of radical self-inquiry applied at the organizational level, right? It's not blame. I'm not saying, well, you're, you know, you made a mistake. It's your fault. You hired him. It's like, no, what was really going on? Oh, well, uh, you know, in, the, in, in the, the story that I tell in the book about, you know, the CEO up, upset with his very greedy head of sales. Right. What I like to say is that that head of that CEO outsourced to a willing participant their internal greed, their need to have all the toys. And then they complained that they had a greedy head of sales. Well, of course you did. Because you didn't understand your own need to have all the toys, to have all the marbles on the board. 
And the result was you had to find somebody else who could carry that because that was inappropriate. That was politically incorrect to say, I'm greedy. Right? And I'm not saying someone should stand up and say, I'm greedy and greed is good, as they said in that old movie, Wall Street. But it's like, what is greed? Oh, it's fear about not having enough. Name that. Talk about that. Be free of the negative behavior. You know, Jerry, this is um, this is awesome. It gives me a new motivation <laughs> to not be upset, uh, or or rather, get more excited any time that there is something. Uh, potentially upsetting or I have any emotion which is uh, which is not at all positive to inquire to see what I can learn about it um, but you've really demonstrated very well how you could take as simple a situation um, and and really dig and, and learn so much from it my question is and like this is maybe like a very tactical thing mm -hmm. is you know the thoughts that go through my mind is a this is very useful and if I actually did this for like in any amount, if I did it more, then I, I, I would get a lot out of it. But the question is like, how do you decide where to spend your time to do this kind of radical self-inquiry and like where you should allow yourself to go on autopilot? You know, this morning as I was on my run, I was thinking about a conversation I had like three and a half years ago. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I just like recounting it, it made me learn something new about what might have happened that yeah, you know, during that conversation. But if I did that about every conversation, I would probably also learn a lot. But how do you decide where to focus your your attention and like where you do uh, the self inquiry on? I, I I love the whole question and the setup too. And congratulations on having a really good meditative moment this morning when you were running. Awesome job, because you didn't set off on the run saying I'm going to think about that conversation. I it just not. arose right? And in the arising, you got curious. And that curiosity is really powerful. Okay. So I, I won't coach you on this, but I'll, I'll say the feeling I had behind the question as you formulated it is it, it sounded like something that people often will, will surface, which is kind of goes like this. Well, this is all well and good, but if I spend all my time doing this, I'm never going to get anything done, and I'm going to be trapped in some sort of self-referential do loop, and never <laughs> ever be able to do anything. <laughs> You're laughing, so it was close. Okay, bang on. All right, right, right. Okay, so um, you know what I would say is um, now I, to be clear, I'm wired. I, I spend a lot of time journaling. I journal every day. This is the, these are the kinds of things that I journal on uh, for me. And then when I put my, close my journal, you know, it's still working in my unconscious, but I'm not expending a lot of energy doing that. Um, but what I would say is that uh, here again, in moments of high emotional energy, I'm pissed off, I'm sad, I'm super happy. Those are beautiful moments, or I feel shamed, or I feel like I'm ruminating on things. Those are all moments. Uh, they're all, think of them as invitations to inquiry. The response of which is to hashtag get curious. Right? Gee, why am I so upset about this? I mean, I, I had a similar incident just happened this weekend. I was in conversation with someone, their reaction triggered something in me. In the moment, I didn't know what was going on for me. I just knew that, that I had to step away. And the next morning, I did a little bit of an emotional inventory and I said, okay, what were the feelings? And the first feeling was surprise. Then the second feeling was threat. I didn't anticipate this. Then the next feeling was helpless. I can't do anything about this. Boy, do I hate feeling helpless. So then I felt anger because I really don't like feeling helpless. And so then the feeling was, I got to get out. 
I got to leave. And I realized in this space that that pattern is a big domineering pattern in my life. And I respond to a lot of situations like that. Now, since Sunday, when I wrote this out in my journal, I've seen this pattern show up two times. It's now only Wednesday. And now that the pattern shows up, I kind of laugh. It's like, oh, wait, wait. There's nothing threatening about being surprised. I just got surprised. Right? So that, that moment, that sequence, probably going to be really, really useful for me in the future to lower the stress, the distress that I can feel in certain situations. So long-winded answer to your question. Use discernment, consider it a tool, and nearly every opportunity is an opportunity for growth. You know, I remember one time, uh, uh, <laughs> writing to one of my Buddhist teachers about being stuck in a middle seat on an airplane on a long flight. There were three seats on the side and I was stuck in the middle and I'm a tall guy, I'm a big guy. And my Buddhist teacher's words kept coming to mind, everything is workable, everything is workable. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the middle seat on a shitty flight. <laughs> All right, it's workable. <laughs> Um, Jerry, that, uh, you know, so many, so many lessons, uh, so many things that we talked about, we, you know, obviously, uh, want people to check you out reboot.io and, uh, and of course, of course the, the book, uh, but one of the questions that we ask every manager and leader out there, um, uh, that comes on the show is, you know, for, for everybody else who's constantly looking to get better at their craft, are there any final tips, tricks, resources, or, or final words of wisdom that you'd like to leave them with? Sure. Um, probably the most important thing is that you already have the answers. Right? If you go quiet within yourself, you know the answer. Even think about what I did with you before. I made you slow down, ask the question again, and you arrived at the answer, right? That's more often not than not, I see leaders really struggle with accessing the answers that they already have inside. And whether it's myself or my colleagues at the company or any good coach, good coach will help you understand that you actually have the answers. You just have to be brave enough to access them. That's great advice and a great place to end it. Jerry, thanks so much for doing this. Thank you for having me on the show and thank you for responding so well to the book. Can't wait to hear about the third time you make it through the book. <laughs>